The power of words to hurt. Introduction, the 24, test. In recent years, whenever I have lectured throughout the country on words that hurt, words that heal, how the words you choose shape your destiny, I've asked my listeners if they can go for 24 without saying any unhind words about or to anybody. Invariably, a minority raise their hands signifying yes, some people laugh, and quite a large number call out, no, all of you who can't answer yes, I respond, must recognize how serious a problem you have, because if I asked you to go for 24 without drinking liquor, and you said, I can't do that I'd tell you, then you must recognize that you're an alcoholic. If I asked you to go for 24 without smoking a cigarette or drinking coffee, and you said, that's impossible, that would mean that you're addicted to nicotine or caffeine. Similarly, if you can't go for 24 without saying unhind words about or to others, then you've lost control over your tongue. At this point, I almost always encounter the same objection. How can you compare the harm done by a bit of gossip or a few unpleasant words to the damage caused by alcohol and smoking or coffee? Is my point overstated? Think about your own life. Unless you, or someone dear to you, have been the victim of terrible physical violence, chances are that the worst pains you have suffered in life have come from words used cruelly, from ego-destroying criticism, excessive anger, sarcasm, public and private humiliation, hurtful nicknames, betrayal of secrets, rumors, and malicious gossip. Yet, wounded as many of us have been by unfairly spoken words, when yet, wounded as many of us have been by unfairly spoken words, when you're with friends and the conversation turns to people not present, what aspects of their lives are you and your companions most likely to explore? Is it not their character flaws and the intimate details of their social lives precisely those aspects of your own life that you would not like to hear others talking about? If you don't participate in such talk, congratulations. But before you assert this as a definite fact, monitor yourself over the next 24. Note on a piece of paper every time you say something negative about someone who is not present without noting what was said that would be too time consuming. Also record when others do so too, as well as your reactions to their words when that happens. You try to silence the speaker, or do you ask more detail? To ensure the test's accuracy, make no effort to change the contents of your conversations throughout the next day and don't try to be kinder than usual in assessing others' character and actions. Note your kind comments as well, but don't go out of your way to increase them during this test period. Most of us who take this test are unpleasantly surprised. Our negative comments about those who are absent is but one way we wound with words. We also often cruelly hurt those to whom we are speaking. One for example, many of us, when enraged, grossly exaggerate the wrong done by the person who has provoked our ire. Anger we express that is disproportionate to the provocation as often occurs when parents rage at children is unfair, often inflicts great hurt and damage, and thus is unethical. How many of you have endured excessive outbursts of rage from another person? Similarly, many of us criticize others with harsh and offensive words or are unable to have a disagreement without provoking a quarrel. Some of us are prone to billeting or humiliating other people, even in public because the damage inflicted by public humiliation can be devastating as noted later. It has even led to suicides. Jewish law questions whether anyone guilty of this offense can ever fully repent. Hurtful speech can, of course, be far less extreme. Have you ever muttered a sarcastic comment that made the person to whom you were speaking feel demeaned or foolish? Many otherwise good people often use words irresponsibly and cruelly in part because they regard the injuries inflicted by words as intangible and therefore they minimize the damage words can inflict. Thus, for generations, children taunted by playmates have been taught to respond. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words or names will never hurt me. Two in our hearts, we all know that this saying is untrue. Even the child who chants sticks and stones knows that words and names do hurt him or her. The statement usually is an attempt at bravado by a child who more likely feels like crying. The National Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse has compiled a list of disparaging comments made by angry parents to children, including, you're pathetic, you can't do anything right, you disgust me, just shut up, hey, stupid, don't you know how to listen, you're more trouble than you're worth, get out of here, I'm sick of looking at your face, I wish you were never born. Does anybody really believe that a child raised with such abuse truly thinks that sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me? The old Jewish teaching related in the epigraph to this book compares the tongue to an arrow. Why not another weapon, a sword, for example? 
one rabbi asks. Because, he is told, if a man unsheaths his sword to kill his friend, and his friend pleads with him and begs for mercy, the man may be mollified and return the sword to its scabbard. But an arrow, once it is shot, cannot be returned. The rabbi's comparison is more than a metaphor. Words can be used to inflict devastating, sometimes irrevocable, suffering. A penitent thief can return the money he has stolen, but one who damages another's reputation through malicious gossip, what is often labeled character assassination, or who humiliates another publicly can never fully undo the damage. As powerful as the capacity of words to hurt is their ability to heal. The anonymous author of a medieval Jewish text, The Ways of the Righteous Orca Tzadikim, spends pages warning of the great evils routinely committed in speech. With the tongue one can commit numerous great and mighty transgressions such as tail-bearing, mockery, flattery, and telling lies. But with words rightly used, he reminds his readers, one can also perform limitless acts of virtue. I remember reading a letter of gratitude sent by the nationally known preacher, Reverend William Stidger, 1885-1949, to an elementary school teacher who had given him great encouragement when he is her student decades earlier. A few days later, Stidger received a response, written in a shaky hand. My dear Willie, I want you to know what your note meant to me. I am an old lady in my 80s, living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, lonely, and seeming like the last leaf on a tree. You will be interested to know, Willie, that I taught school for 50 years, and in all that time, yours is the first letter of appreciation I have ever received. It came on a cold blue morning, and cheered my lonely old heart as nothing has cheered me in many years. Later, I relate a story from perhaps the best-known lawyer today in the United States, Alan Dershowitz, whose life as an insecure teenager was permanently transformed by five words spoken to him by a drama counselor at the summer camp where he was working C Chapter 13. For Alan Sherman, the comic songwriter of Hello Mudda, Hello Fatta, it was six words spoken by his grandmother that healed a humiliation that had earlier caused him to slam a door and hide in his bedroom see chapter 13. And for Avi, a career criminal and drug addict estranged from his family, it was a verbal image created by the psychiatrist Dr. Abraham Tversky that started him on the road to becoming a law-abiding citizen devoted to extricating other drug addicts from lives of crime and purposelessness. Anxious as I am for you to dive in and read this book, please take the 24-hour diagnostic test first. Monitor how often you say needlessly critical, hurtful, and even cynical things about and to the people around you. Even if you are unhappy with the results, don't be discouraged. The way you speak is something you can change. And if you're willing to make the effort, you can start changing quickly. Today, perhaps the most surprising thing you will learn is the extent to which control over your tongue accompanied by the practice of healing speech, will not only change for the better the lives of all those with whom you interact, but change your own life as well. You might think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. Healing words both those we direct toward others and those directed toward us create courage. Courage creates vision. With vision and courage, we become unafraid to take risks and are willing to hold on to our vision and work toward it. This, in the final analysis, is what shapes our destiny. Chapter 1 The Insufficiently Recognized Power of Words to Hurt The Gossiper Stands in Syria and Kills in Rome Jerusalem Talmud P. In a small Eastern European town, a man went through the community slandering the rabbi. One day, feeling suddenly remorseful and mindful of just how unfair many of his comments had been he begged the rabbi for forgiveness and offered to undergo any penance to make amend. The rabbi told him to take a feather pillow from his home, cut it open, scatter the feathers to the wind, then return to see him. The man did as he was told, then came back to the rabbi and asked, Am I now forgiven? Almost, came the response. You just have to do one more thing. Go and gather all the feathers. But that's impossible, the man protested. The wind has already scattered them. Precisely, the rabbi and, and although you truly wish to correct the evil you have done, it is as impossible to repair the damage done by your words as it is to recover the feathers. This famous tale is a lesson about slander of course, but it also is a testimony to the power of speech. Words said about us define our place in the world. On to that place, our reputation is defined particularly if the definition is negative, it is very difficult to reverse. It is perhaps for this reason that the Jewish tradition views words as tangible in Hebrew. One of the terms for words is devarim, which also means things and extremely powerful. The Bible clearly acknowledges the potency of words, teaching that God created the world with words. As the third verse of Genesis records, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. 
Like God, human beings also create with words. We have all had the experience of reading a novel and being so moved by the fate of one of its characters that we felt love, hate, or anger. Sometimes we cried, even though the individual whose fate so moved us never existed. All that happened was that a writer took a blank piece of paper or opened a blank screen and through words alone created a human being real enough to evoke our deepest emotion. That words are powerful may seem obvious, but the fact is that most of us, most of the time, use them lightly. We choose our clothes more carefully and we choose our words, though what we say about and to others can define them indelibly. That is why ethical speech speaking fairly of others, honestly about selves, and carefully to everyone is so important. If we keep the power of words in the foreground of our consciousness, we will handle them as carefully as we would a loaded gun. Unfair speech does more than harm its victim, it also is self-destructive. The psychiatrist Antonio would notes that when we speak ill of someone, we alienate selves from that person. The more negative our comments, the more distant we feel from their object. Thus, the one who speaks unfairly of many people comes to distance and alienate himself from many individuals, and as Doctor Wood notes, alienation is a major cause of depression, one of the most widespread disorders in America. The avoidance of alienation is but one way in which we can benefit when we refrain from unethical speech. People who minimize the amount of gossip in which they engage generally find that their connections to others become more intimate and satisfying. For many, exchanging information and opinions about other people is an easy, if divisive, way of bonding with others. But those who refrain from gossiping are forced to focus more on themselves and the person to whom they are speaking. The relationship thereby established almost invariably is emotionally deeper. In addition, when we make an effort to speak fairly to others and avoid angry explosions, we find that our social interactions become smoother. Admittedly, when you're angry at someone, maintaining a good relationship with that individual might seem irrelevant. But consider particularly if you have a quick temper whether you've ever heard yourself say, I don't care if I never speak temper whether you've ever heard yourself say, I don't care if I never speak to him or her again, about someone with whom you are now friendly. People who learn to speak fairly avoid going through life regretting the cruel words they said and the needless ending of friendships. In the larger society, too, we are in urgent need of more civilized discourse. Throughout history, words used unfairly have promoted hatred and even murder. The medieval crusaders didn't wake up one morning and begin randomly killing Jews. Rather, they and their ancestors had been conditioned for centuries to think of Jews as Christ killers, and thus as less than human or worse, as allies of the devil. Once this verbal characterization took hold, it became easy to kill Jews. African Americans were long branded with words that depicted them as subhuman apes, jungle bunnies, niggers. The ones who first used such words did not choose these terms at random and for no reason. They hoped that such words would enable whites to view blacks as different and inferior to themselves. This was important because if whites perceived blacks as fully human, then supposedly decent people could never have arranged for them to be kidnapped from their native lands, beaten, branded, and enslaved. Unfair, often cruel, speech continues to poison our society. I remember in the early 1990s a very popular and influential perhaps the most influential talk show host repeatedly labeled those feminists he regarded as radically pro-chose, and radical in other ways as well, feminazis. Given that the Nazis and the government they established are regarded as about the most evil people in history, the word Nazi should be removed from our vocabulary except when speaking about the Nazis themselves or people who truly model themselves on them. To call a feminist like Gloria Steinem a feminazi, as this talk show host did, is rhetoric that, in my view, is unethical, makes rational discourse impossible, and unintentionally mocks the sufferings of the Nazis' real victims. Unfortunately, over the following decades this host has continued to find the term feminazi useful in dismissing some of those whom he opposes. This sort of verbal incivility has characterized some highly partisan liberals no less than conservative. When George H. W. Bush was elected president in 1988, a prominent congressman who soon went on to become House Majority Leader, along with a major city mayor who had earlier served as the ambassador to the United Nations, commented that not since the days of Hitler and Goebbels had a political campaign been built so deliberately on the technique of the big lie. What an irony! In the very act of condemning Bush's campaign for its supposed lies, these men told a vicious and much bigger untruth. With similarly overwrought and unethical language, one of the country's most influential senators reacted to one of President Ronald Reagan's Supreme Court nominations by asserting, 
Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions, blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters, rogue police could break down citizens' doors in midnight raids, school children could not be taught about evolution, and writers and artists could be censored at the whim of government. For those familiar with Judge Bork's views and judicial record knew that the statement was an amalgamation of untruths and misleading half-truths. But the senator's agenda was neither accuracy nor fairness, it was defeating Bork's nomination. It is important to emphasize that all of us not just political candidates can be passionate about our convictions without denigrating the intelligence and morality of those with whom we disagree. Unfortunately, this is hard for many people to do. Every four years during presidential campaigns, I ask audiences lectures if they can think of a single reason someone might vote for the candidate whom they oppose that doesn't reflect badly on either the voters how hard. I rarely find liberals or conservatives who can do so. This is very unfortunate because it means that passionate liberals and passionate conservatives often presume that about half of the population is deficient in either intelligence or character. Yet people don't have to think about political disagreements in this way. Robert Dole, the Republican presidential candidate in 1996 and a man by no means averse to fighting vigorously on behalf of what he believed, nonetheless took care to remind his followers that the Democrats are our opponents, not our enemy. In 2008, when Republican presidential candidate John McCain found himself at a rally in which people were denouncing his opponent, Barack Obama, as a liar and a terrorist, McCain shook his head took the mic and said, he's a decent family man, a citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on fundamental issues, and that's what this campaign is all about. McCain in no way felt the need to minimize or downplay his political opposition to Obama, but he didn't feel as do many people on both sides of the political divide today in America that he had to denigrate his opponent as human being. If I didn't think I'd be one heck of a better president, I wouldn't be running, McCain declared. But he then went on. Having said that, I will respect him. I want everyone to be respectful. Because that's the way politics should be conducted in America. Or at least that's the way political campaigns should be conducted in America, or anywhere that the focus on issues and the candidates disputes about those issues. But political campaigns and political dialogue in general increasingly focus not on issues, but on personalizing conflict and dehumanizing one's opponents. And unfortunately, once people feel contempt, dislike, and hatred for the candidate they oppose, it is quite easy for those feelings to spill over into contempt and hatred toward those who voted for that candidate. Why wouldn't it? If all you know about a person is that he supported the candidacy of a person you believe to be a vile human being, then why, so the thinking goes, should you have any respect, let alone affection, for such a person? In consequence, the level of discourse over these past years, by both the right and the left, has continued to deteriorate reaching a low point in the 2016 presidential campaign. To the extent possible in discussing actual events, I prefer not to name names though, for a variety of reasons. This is not always feasible. In the events I am discussing, candidates, instead of critiquing the policies of their opponents, attack their very person. Thus, the aforementioned John McCain, who was captured and endured torture often several times a week and abuse as a prisoner of the North Vietnamese during the Vietnam War, has long been regarded as a hero by almost all Americans, both liberals and conservatives, but not by the Republican candidate who eventually won the nomination. He's not a war hero, Donald Trump said of McCain. He was a war hero because he was captured. I like people who weren't captured. This was a particularly mean-spirited comment about a man who had fought for the United States and endured torture and imprisonment in horrifying conditions for five and a half years. McCain also refused to accept an offer of early release because the North Vietnamese would not release other American prisoners who had been captured before him. Other comments made by the candidate displayed a disturbing lack of fairness and civility. Thus, while there is a long and sad history of men mocking the looks of women a regard as unattractive or whom they simply dislike, this sort of cruel banter did not normally become part of a presidential campaign, till this candidate made it so. One of his opponents in the primary race to secure the Republican nomination was a highly distinguished businesswoman and the former CEO of a major company. I am omitting her name because, while she is deservedly famous, I suspect that the incident I am about to recall is not an aspect of her life she wants to be associated with. How did her opponent evaluate her as a candidate? Look at that face, would anyone vote for that? And you imagine that as the face of our next president, 
When this woman launched her campaign, I assume she had prepared herself to have some of her political positions severely challenged and attacked. But I doubt she had prepared herself to have her physical looks mocked. No candidate, man or woman, should have to expect that. I suspect that some I hope not many of Trump's supporters found such a comment amusing, but it was cruel. Who would not be offended and hurt to be publicly described as particularly unattractive? Similarly, Trump had every right to criticize the political views of another woman, a major media figure. But what made his remarks about this woman so memorable was one particular observation, that she is unattractive both inside and out. I fully understand why her former husband left her for a man. He made a good choice. Obviously, it was this comment about what had to have been a very painful event in this woman's life that most stuck in listeners' minds. A person can speak like that publicly ridiculing the sad and painful events in another person's life only if he has ceased to relate to the other person as if they were like himself, a person with feelings. The response of some passionate liberals to conservatives have likewise often been cruelly unfair and uncivil. How else can one assess Congressman William Clay's 1980s claim that President Ronald Reagan was trying to replace the Bill of Rights with fascist precepts lifted verbatim from main camp? I'm identifying Congressman Clay by name because his statement was so extreme and untethered to reality that people might think I made it up. For a congressman to make such a remark would seem unthinkable. But the congressman did say that. And what is one to make of a statement by a prominent South Carolina congressman concerning the direction of the United States under President Donald Trump. Having studied history and having taught history, I can only equate one period of time with what we are experiencing now. And that was what was going on in Germany around 1933 right after the 1932 election when Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor. When the congressman was challenged about his implied comparison of Trump to Hitler, he walked back his comment a bit saying that it would be more accurate to compare President Trump to Mussolini in other words, to compare him to the most famous fascist who ever lived rather than to the most famous Nazi. What should seem self-evident, and is most important about these types of comments, is that they are untrue. Ronald Reagan preferred Mein Kampf to the Bill of Rights. Then the congressman, aching this accusation, would not have been serving in the House of Representatives, but would have been in jail, or worse. In actuality, President Reagan completed his second term in 1989, while Congressman Clay remained in office until 2001. Civil discourse in America becomes increasingly difficult when a liberal congressman compares Republican attacks on the health care overhaul pushed by President Obama to the Nazi propaganda of Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda. The congressman soon had to issue a clarification. I want to be clear that I never called Republicans Nazis, instead the reference I made was to the greatest propaganda master of all time. But obviously, invoking Goebbels' name in the midst of a political fight that had nothing to do with World War II or the Holocaust can only engender ill will and prompt people to associate their political opponents with Nazis and Nazi-like propaganda. There are consequences to the dehumanizing of one's opponents. To cite one example, and there is no shortage of others in October 2017, a mass shooting occurred in Las Vegas directed against country music concircle. 58 people were murdered and 861 were wounded. The reaction of the vice president and senior legal counsel at CBS obviously a substantial, even coveted, position was. I'm actually not even sympathetic because country music fans often are Republican gun talk. Tense, by this lawyer's logic, there is no reason to regret that 58 people died each one of them someone's mother, father, or child and because they are Republicans, and maybe even conservative Republicans, the country is better off without them. I am omitting the woman's name on the assumption that she actually might be ashamed of having made such a heartless statement CBS, realizing that its very moral credibility was at stake, fired this executive. When I use the word dehumanize, I mean it quite literally. Some of the comments I have cited here not all are cruel specifically because the person making them have ceased to see the person or people whom they dislike as fellow human beings. In certain segments of popular culture, such dehumanization has been going on for several decades. Musical genre, gangster rap, pioneer in the 1980, contains lyrics that glorify killing police and raping women. The album The Ghetto Boys, by the group of the same name, includes this horrendous couplet. I dug between the chair and whipped out the machete, she screamed. I sliced her up until her guts were like spaghetti. Another lyric in the same album speaks of the need to stab the girl in her breasts and just cut her to bits. Marion Wright Adelman, 
the African-American founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund, expressed her horror at the cruelty of such lyrics and their massive disrespect to women. Having herself been raised in a culture in which men were encouraged to woo the hearts of women by opening doors for them and giving up their seats when only one seat was available, Wright Edelman was enraged by the filthy, disrespectful, and misogynistic lyrics of Snoop Doggy Dog and Dr. Dre and others who shamelessly dishonor our foremothers, grandmothers, mothers, sisters, and daughters by referring to them as hosts slang for whores and bishop. The shame of those who by this debasing music is matched or exceeded only by those who profit so greatly from the record companies and the performers. Gangster rap is only one manifestation of contemporary music's incendiary usage of language. When Axl Rose, lead singer of Guns and Roses famous for the lyric, I'll rip your heart in two and leave you lying on the bed, attended a homecoming concert in Indianapolis some years ago, he told his cheering fans that kids in Indiana today are just like prisoners in Auschwitz. The talk show host Michael Medv commented, when Rose later defended these appalling remarks in conversations with reporters, no one thought to ask him the obvious question. If he really believes that parents are like guards at a Nazi death camp, wouldn't teenagers be perfectly justified in killing them in order to achieve their freedom? The use of language to humiliate, degrade, and enrage likewise typifies many of the lyrics of Imana. To cite just one example, and there are many others, a song entitled, Kill You, contains the following rhyme. Slut, you think I won't choke no whore, till the vocal cords don't work in her throat no more. I cite Eminem, because he is by no means a minor figure. His songs and their accompanying videos routinely garner 50 million or more viewers within days of release. A 19th century story tells of a man who saw a large sign over a store, pants pressed here. He brought in his pants to be pressed, only to be told, we don't press pants here, we only make signs. The sign makers of our time are those who compare their political opponents or parents to Nazis and who glorify the mutilation of women, sure, those who use words to incite rather than inform. Violence, however, is only one possible result of unethical speech. Another is the destruction of what decent people consider their most important possession, a good name. Raymond Donovan, Secretary of Labor in President Reagan's administration, was the victim of a long campaign of rumors and innuendo that finally culminated in a criminal prosecution. After running up legal bills in excess of $1 million, he was acquitted of all charges. When he emerged from the courtroom and reporters swarmed around him for his comment, Donovan Posada bitter question, where do I go to get my reputation back? Truly as the anguished Ray Donovan knew once feathers have been scattered to the wind, they can never be fully recovered. Part 2. How we speak about others. Chapter 2. The irrevocable damage inflicted by gossip. Lashon Hara, the whispering campaign that cannot be stopped, rumors it's impossible to quash, besmirchment from which you will never be cleansed, slanderous stories to belittle your professional qualifications, derisive reports of your business deceptions and your perverse aberrations, outrage polemics denouncing your moral failings, misdeeds, and faulty character traits, your shallowness, your vulgarity, your cowardice, your avarice, your indecency, your falseness, your selfishness, your treachery, derogatory information, defamatory statements, insulting witticisms, disparaging anecdotes, idle mockery, fishy chatter, malicious absurdities, galling wisecracks, fantastic lies, lashon hara of such spectacular dimensions that it is guaranteed not only to bring on fear, distress, spiritual isolation, and financial loss, but to significantly shorten a life. They will make a shambles of the position that you worked nearly 60 years to achieve. No area of your life will go uncontaminated. And if you think this is an exaggeration, you really are deficient in a sense of reality. Philip Roth, Operation Shylock. A gossip always seeks out the faults of people. He is like the flies who always rest on a person's dirty spot. If a person has boils, the flies will ignore the rest of the body and sit on the boil. And thus it is with the gossip. He overlooks all the good in a person and speaks only of the evil. The ways of the righteous or caught teasadigan. What does a good guest say? How much trouble has my host gone to for me? How much meat he set before me, how much wine he brought me, how many cakes he served me, and all this trouble he has gone to for my sake. But what does a bad guest say? What kind of effort did the host make for me? I have eaten only one slice of bread. I have eaten only one piece of meat, and I have drunk only one cup of wine. Whatever trouble the host went to was done only for the sake of his wife and children. These two takes on the same party, reported in the Talmud nearly 2,000 years ago, get straight to the heart of ethical speech. 
the fact that, given a willing ear, many of us, if not most, are bad guests and often disloyal friends. It is infinitely more interesting to look for others' flaws than to praise their good quality. How much more satisfying it is to chew over the fact that so-and-so is having an affair, was fired from his job for incompetence, has filed for bankruptcy, or, less seriously, tells very unfunny jokes and then laughs at them uproariously, and it is to discuss how good a husband, how loyal an employee, how financially circumspect, and how wonderful a raconteur he may be. How strange that dinner parties, where we have partaken of a host's hospitality, so often seem to prompt critical post-mortems. My hunch is that more speculative, and often unkind, gossip and character analysis are exchanged immediately after people leave a dinner party and at any other time. How often during the ride home from a dinner party have you speculated about your host's wealth, marriage relationship, aesthetic sensibilities, taste in food, intelligence, or children's personality? It is obvious how very unfair such talk is. I know that when my wife and invite people over for dinner or a party, we work incredibly hard for many hours, sometimes even several days, to make the evening as pleasant as possible for our guests. It hurts to think that they might share critical observations about us as they drive home afterward. I don't think I am being paranoid in fearing that this is what many of them do because, regretfully, I know how often I have done myself. When leaving the home of someone who has worked hard to provide you with a pleasant evening, the simplest and fairest rule to follow is to say nothing disparaging about them. If you find that you are incapable of abiding by this rule, at least don't speak negatively during the ride home. Hold off for a day. Perhaps when you finally make your comments, they will be toned down. Before saying anything, Think about the effort this person expended to make the gathering pleasant, and ask yourself if it is appropriate to respond with critical observations. Few things seem more unjust than partaking of other people's hospitality, thanking them, and then, like a spy, utilizing information you acquire in their home to cut them down. If you think that your comments about others are rarely malicious, then ask yourself, would you be willing to make the same remarks directly to your host? If the answer is no, then why make these remarks to others? The impulse to be a bad guest violates the following biblical injunction. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. This directive is the foundation of the Bible's guidelines on ethical speech and it appears only two verses before the Bible's most famous law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because the biblical commandment is so terse, it is difficult to know exactly what is meant by talebearing. Does it mean that you are forbidden to talk about any aspect of other people's lives, such as telling a friend, I was at a party at so-and-so's house last night, and it's absolutely amazing what they've done with their kitchen. Or does the verse outlaw only damning insinuations? When Sam went away on that business trip last month, I saw his wife, Sally, at a fancy restaurant with this very good-looking guy, and she didn't see me because they were too busy the whole time making eyes at each other. Is it tale-bearing to pass on true stories Betty told me that Sally confessed to her that she's planning to divorce Sam? The Bible itself never fully answers questions of this nature, but starting with the early centuries of the Common Era, Jewish teachers elaborated upon the biblical law and formulated, in ascending order of seriousness, three types of speech that people should decrease or eliminate. 1. Information and comments about others that are non-defamatory and true. 2. True but negative stories in Hebrew. Lashon Haran. Such information lowers people's esteem for the person about whom it is told. A subdivision is tattling in Hebrew, Rachel telling Judy, for example, the critical things that Ben said about her. 3. Lies in Hebrew, Matzi Shemra, statements that are negative and false. Rumors commonly fall into this category, as often they are both negative and false, non-defamatory, and true remarks. The comment, I was at a party at so-and-so's house last night and it's absolutely amazing what they've done with their kitchen, is nigh famatory and true. What possible reason could there be for discouraging people from exchanging such innocuous, even complimentary, information? Exchanging such innocuous, even complimentary, information. For one thing, the listener might not find the information so innocuous. While one person is describing how wonderful the party was, the other might well wonder, why wasn't I invited? I had them over to my house just a month ago, or, funny that they had the money to redo their kitchen since they pleaded poverty when I asked them to contribute to the new hospice. The more important reason for discouraging innocuous gossip is that it really remains so. Suppose I suggest that you and a friend spend 20 minutes talking about a mutual acquaintance, 
How likely is it that you will devote the entire time to exchanging stories about the person's niceness? Maybe you will that is, if the person about whom you're speaking is Mother Teresa. Otherwise, even if the person being spoken about is a very good person, the conversation will often take on a negative tone. This is because, for most of us, exchanging critical evaluations of others is more interesting and enjoyable than exchanging accolades. If I say to you, Janet is a wonderful person, but there's just one thing I can't stand about her. On what aspects of Janet's personality do you think the rest of our conversation is likely to focus? Even if you don't let the discussion shift in a negative direction, becoming an ethical speaker forces you to anticipate the inadvertent harm that your words might cause. For example, although praising a friend might seem like a laudable, doing so in the presence of someone who dislikes her will probably do your friend's reputation more harm than good. Your words may well provoke her antagonist to voice her reasons for disliking your friend, particularly if you leave soon after making your positive remarks. Strangely enough, the Bible depicts God as causing terrible damage to righteous man by praising him in his enemy's presence. As the book of Job opens, God is surrounded by angels, and one of them is Satan, who informs God that he has been roaming the earth. The Lord asks Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan accuses God of being naive. Does not Job have good reason to be God-fearing? Why, it is you who has put a fence around him and his household and all that he has. You have blessed his efforts so that his possessions spread out in the land. But lay your hand upon all that he has and he will surely blaspheme you to your face. Confident that Job will remain loyal to him no matter what the provocation, the Lord permits Satan to do anything to Job except take his life. In short order, Satan arranges to have Job's ten children killed, his possessions destroyed, and Job himself afflicted with terrible malady. Although the Book of Job records a series of happy events at its ending, would anyone dispute that Job's life world series of happy events at its ending, would anyone dispute that Job's life would have proceeded far more smoothly had God not chosen to praise him before Satan? The danger of praise leading to damage is at the root of the book of Proverbs' rather enigmatic observation. He who blesses his neighbor in a loud voice in the morning, it will later be thought a curse. Bible commentaries understand this to mean that if a person comes to public notice, even as a result of a neighbor's blessing, a positive association, the intense scrutiny engendered by his newfound fame ultimately will probably damage his good name or worse. Such was the fate that befell Oliver Sippel, an ex-Marine who saved the life of President Gerald Ford. While Ford was visiting San Francisco in 1975, Stipple's Sarah Jane Moore, who was standing next to him, aimed a gun directly at the president. Sipple grabbed Moore's arm and deflected her aim so that the bullet missed the president. Overnight, he became a national hero. When reporters came to interview Sipple, he had only one request. Don't publish anything about me. Unfortunately, his plea piqued the journalist's curiosity. Within days, the San Francisco Chronicle and the Los Angeles Times, quickly followed by dozens of other newspapers, trumpeted the news that Sipple was active in gay causes in the San Francisco area. Of course, there is still prejudice against gays in the United States today, but there was far greater antagonism toward gays at that time. When her porter confronted Sipple's mother in Detroit and asked her what she knew about her son's apparent homosexuality, she was visibly stunned, since she had known nothing about it. Of course, that was the reason Sipple had begged reporters not to write about his life. Shortly thereafter, his mother stopped speaking to him. When she died four years later, his father informed Sipple that he wouldn't be welcome at her funeral. Devastated by the rupture in his relationship with his family, Sipple began to drink heavily and became increasingly withdrawn from those around him. A few years later, he was found in his apartment, dead at age 47. The Los Angeles Times reporter who publicized Sipple's homosexuality made this post-mortem comment, If I had to do it over again, I wouldn't. But why did he and the other reporters have to tell the story about Sipple in the first place? Sipple had saved the life of the president, and the entire country was deeply in his debt. Yet the insatiable curiosity of the press and readers to learn the true story about this new American hero caused them to search for a fresh angle. After all, how many times could they describe how he had caused Moore's gun to misfire? His action, while very heroic, became somewhat boring after two or three tellings. The simple case demonstrates the inadvertent damage that can be done even when people start out talking positively about others. Unless we remain acutely conscious of the direction in which a conversation is heading, such talk is unlikely to remain innocuous especially from the perspective of the person being discussed. 
Negative means spirited truths Lashon Hara. As a rule, most people seem to think that there is nothing morally wrong with spreading negative information about others as long as the information is true. Jewish law takes a very different view. Perhaps that is why the Hebrew term Lashon Hara literally bad language or bad tongue has no precise equivalent in English. For unlike slander, which is universally condemned as immoral because it is false or gossip, which might or might not be true, Lashon Haran is by definition true. It is the dissemination of accurate information that will lower a person's status. I translate it as negative truths, or as my friend the late Rabbi Israel Stein used to render it, mean-spirited truths. The fairness of negative information is particularly important but frequently overlooked by people who disseminate it. I often ask lecture audiences, how many of you can think of at least one episode in your life that would cause you great embarrassment were it to become known to everyone else here? Usually, almost every hand goes up, except for those who have poor memories, who have led exceptionally boring lives, or who are lying. I suspect that most people who raise their hands are not concealing a history of armed robbery. Nevertheless, were a particularly embarrassing episode to become known to the public, it might disproportionately influence others' impressions of them. Because such information would probably be unusual, it might even become other people's primary association with the person, which of course is the very reason he or she wants it kept private. Thus, although such information is true, disseminating it would be unfair. That is why Jewish law forbids spreading negative truths about anyone unless the person to whom you are speaking needs the information. For examples of when and to whom such information should be revealed, see Chapter 4. Two centuries ago, Jonathan K. Lavader, a Swiss theologian and poet, offered a still guideline that highlights the unfairness of spreading such information. Never tell evil of a man if you do not know it for a certainty, and if you know it for a certainty, then ask yourself, why should I tell it? Intention also has a great deal to do with the circumstances in which it is prohibited to speak negative truths. A statement, depending on the context, can constitute a compliment, gossip of the non-defamatory sort, or the more serious offense of Lashon Harat for example. If you say that a person known to have limited funds gave $100 to a certain charity, this information would probably raise his stature because people will be impressed with his generosity. But if you say that a very wealthy individual gave $100 to the same cause, others' respect for him will be diminished, as this information makes him look miserly. Such statement therefore is Lashon Haran. It might be true, but it lowers respect for the person, and it is very unlikely that the person to whom you are relating this information really needs it. Unfortunately, people are often undeterred from speaking negative truths. Such gossip is often so interesting that it impels many of us to violate the golden rule do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Although we would probably want similarly embarrassing information about ourselves to be kept quiet, many of us refuse to be equally discreet when it comes to others' sensitive secrets. As noted earlier, the golden rule can be violated in another way as well. If you entered a room unnoticed and heard people talking about you, what would you least like to hear them speaking about? Most likely, your character flaw sand slash or the intimate details of your social life. Yet when you gossip with friends about others, what are you if you are like most people most likely to talk about? Is it not the character flaws and intimate details of the social lives of others? The Jewish ethical injunction against unfair speech applies not only to the use of words but also to lowering another's reputation non-verbally. Making a face when someone's name is mentioned, rolling your eyes, winking, or saying sarcastically, yeah, he's a real genius, isn't he, are all violations of the law. When I was growing up, a child would often say something positive about another, then clear his throat in such a manner as to convey that he really meant precisely the opposite. Since Lashon Hara is regarded as anything that lowers another person's status, it is irrelevant whether the technique used to commit it is verbal or nonverbal. Jewish law designates this behavior as Avik Lashon Haran. Other examples of such behavior include innuendo, don't mention Paula's name to me. I don't want to say what I know about her. It is equally wrong to imply that there is something derogatory about a person's earlier life who among us who knew Jonathan years ago would have guessed that he would achieve the success he has now. Achieve the success he has now. Such behavior encompasses a whole range of stratagems by which people sometimes damage reputations without saying anything specifically critical. For example, it is morally wrong to show someone a letter you have received that contains spelling mistakes if all you wish to do is cause the reader to have diminished respect for the letter writer's intelligence. 
It is similarly wrong to show a person an unflattering photograph of another and for the two of you to laugh about the picture. When it comes to Lashon Haran, if your goal is to lower another person's status, then it can be done equally effectively through words, a sarcastic laugh, or sharing a letter that holds its writer up to ridicule. Each of these methods is effective, cruel, and wrong. When gossip is falsely attributed to you, if a rumor circulates that you said something unkind about someone and it isn't true, you must make this known both to the person involved and to others. If you don't, the person slandered will remain justifiably hurt and angry. Compare the ways in which two different public figures dealt with this situation. In Attlee, a biography of Clement Attlee, a British prime minister and longtime political adversary of Winston Churchill, the author, Kenneth Harris, notes the following incident. After the war, one quip which went the rounds of Westminster was attributed to Churchill himself. An empty taxi arrived at 10 Downing Street, and when the door was opened, Atlee got out. When, a friend repeated this, and its attribution, to Churchill he obviously did not like it. His face set hard, and after an awful pause he said, Mr. Atlee is an honorable and gallant gentleman, and a faithful colleague who served his country well at the time of her greatest need. I should be obliged if you would make it clear whenever an occasion arises that would never make such a remark about him, and that I strongly disapprove of anybody who does. Compare Churchill's disavowal of this cruel, if witty, comment with the behavior of a prominent former congresswoman toward New York's one-time Mayor Ed Koch. Unlike Atlee and Churchill, the congresswoman and Koch had long been political allies. In fact, he had campaigned for her when she ran for thus. Congress, as she did for him when he ran for City Hall. Several years later, this woman took a trip with New York City Mayor David Dinkins to lobby the Democratic Party to hold its 1992 national convention in New York City. In a newspaper article about the trip, she was quoted as saying New York City. In a newspaper article about the trip, she was quoted as saying that she was happy to be traveling with Dinkins, whereas she would hate the thought of spending a week with Cock. The latter, unaware of any falling out between them, was both incensed and confused. A few months later, Cock was even more stunned when the woman, launching run for the U.S. Senate, called him at his law office to solicit his support. In his memoirs, Citizen Cock, he records the ensuing conversation. Well, I said, it's strange that you should call me, because you are the last person I would support. Why do you say that, Ed, she said. I thought we were friends. I thought so too, I replied. I then reminded her of her remarks from several months back. Did I say that, she said. Yes, I said. Well, I don't remember ever saying that. I have the clipping here at my office, I explained. I can send you a copy to refresh your memory. Well, if I did say it, she allowed, it must have been taken out of context. Did you write a letter to the editor, stating you had been quoted out of context? No. Did you call the reporter, or send him a note, seeking a retraction? No. Did you call me, to apologize, or offer an explanation? No. Then it wasn't out of context, I said. Cock was right. If you have publicly said something cruel that you regret, call the victim of your remarks immediately, and apologize. You can be sure that the person will have heard about it, and if you don't apologize, he or she has a right to assume that you meant precisely what you said. In a column by the Pulitzer Prize winning writer Brett Stevens, when the White House lies about you, he details a damaging and mean-spirited untruth told about him by a high-level White House official. The official tweeted that Stevens had publicly named a covert CIA officer. What particularly provoked Stevens' anger was that, though the untruth might well have started as a mistake, the government official refused to correct it even after Stevens repeatedly informed him that the slanderous comment was untrue. To summarize Stevens's argument, and to play off Cox's comment as well, when you make a mistake and refuse to correct it, it ceases to be a mistake. It becomes intentional. People simply don't forget cruel words directed against them or against someone they love. Should you be accused of having uttered such words, your only hope for making peace is to deny those words forcefully and immediately, both privately and publicly, if they are untrue, and to apologize in the same manner if they are true. Tattling, a subdivision of Lashon Haran, Rishil, is tattling telling people the negative comments that others have made about them. Several years ago, when a friend of mine announced her engagement, her sister repeated a remark made by their beloved uncle. Mary's a very sweet girl, but Robert is much more accomplished and worldly than she is. I'm afraid that he's going to get bored with her. For Mary, whose father had died when she was very young, her uncle's critical words were devastating. And she got married, she refused to walk on the aisle with him, as they had long planned. Today, several years later, their once warm relationship is almost non-existent, 
Coincidentally, I saw Mary's sister a short time later and asked her about this incident. The statement just slipped out, she told me. She had been chatting with Mary, and it suddenly occurred to her that she should know what their uncle really thought. The sister's answer, a standard justification offered by people who transmit hurtful comments, seems inarguable in theory. Aren't we entitled to know whether the people who act warmly in our presence say cutting things when we are absent? In practice, however, the one small piece of truth transmitted by gossip often makes a very false impression. Once Mary heard her uncle's comment, she concluded that it constituted his exclusive opinion of her. After all, Mary's sister hadn't made a habit of repeating every complimentary observation their uncle had made about her. While the uncle's comment may well have been unhind, in truth almost all of us have said hurtful things about people otherwise loved dearly. How many of us would be comfortable with our parents, children, spouses, and friends hearing every remark that we've ever made about them? I lay it down as a fact, the great 17th century French philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote, that if all men knew what others say of them, there would not be four friends in the world. And as Mark Twain once said, it takes your enemy and your friend, working together, to hurt you to the heart, the one to slander you and the other to get the news to you. Of course, there are times when it is appropriate to pass on such information. If you hear someone saying that another person is dishonest and you know this to be false, you should both publicly dispute the statement and warn the person to be false. You should both publicly dispute the statement and warn the person of what is being said about him.